So from the great, from the great flagship university, the University of Massachusetts, David Glasper is going to join us and actually explain to us what is environmental history. So uh, looking forward to that. So come on up, David, and join us. So again, I'm going to let them uh, have some open statements. And uh, I may interject a little bit, but again, we want to get uh, to you and see what's on your minds and what they're going to give us uh, as food for thought. So I think you all have microphones. Ladies first. Oh, I've got your microphone. <laughs> all right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good. Um, I, you know, this morning's the opening panel was very inspiring hearing um, about Jane Addams. And uh, the speaker mentioned community action in her, in her remarks. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what we do. But first, I'd just like to note that we're in the Edwards Church that was named after Jonathan Edwards, you know, the preacher uh, here in Northampton where the Great Awakening started, where um, the belief that, you know, faith in God alone was necessary to get to heaven, not necessarily uh, Puritan, Puritan obedience to um, very strict moral standards, right? So. We seem like we're at a time of another great awakening, maybe not the same kind, but one that maybe we can take advantage of about thinking about how we build community, how we are, are truly people of faith, not necessarily only in God, if you don't believe in God, but also in the essential goodness of each and every person that we, in our communities, in our country, and in the world, as opposed to seeing enemies everywhere we look. So I'm hoping that we're at the beginning of that. And I guess if we don't have that kind of hope, it's really hard to move forward, so I'm going to hang on to it anyway. Um, community Action is um, one of 1,100 community action agencies across the country that came, came, were created at another time of hope in 1964 when Lyndon Baines Johnson um, passed the, the bills that created what we call now the War on Poverty. And, um, and at the same time, we had a civil rights movement that was actually having some successes. So another time when there was some hope in the country. Of course, that the hopes for really moving forward at that time were dashed by the um, relentless waging of the war in Vietnam, which diverted resources, time, attention, and the lives of many people from moving in a much more uh, positive way. Um, but 11, these 1,100 agencies still exist across the country. Uh, we're by, stat, by federal law, we each have um, boards that are made up of one-third people who live in our communities living with low incomes or who have lived with low incomes, one-third people who are appointed by elected officials, and one-third of the people who are appointed in our community that have some interest in the work that we do. We have a wide range of things we do. Some of them um, are really straight up income support, helping people keep their houses warm by helping them pay their fuel bill, or helping, um, uh, we help people who are maybe on the brink of homelessness by helping them pay their rent uh, for a month or two. Some of what we do is supporting families, both um, both the parent and the child in the, in the household uh, through the Head Start program, which is one of those 1964 programs, through um, full day, full year, early education and care for families who are working or have another need. We run family, uh, we've run a family center in Greenfield, uh, which has a huge number of programs there. We run a significant number of programs for young people. Again, one of the very earliest programs of the war in poverty was youth employment. So I just want to make a note that when that program started, when the war in poverty started, the community action agencies were in an office in the federal government that was in the west wing of the White House. That's how important it was to the president. And the program, the office was called the Office of Economic Opportunity. Now it's called the Office of Community Services, and it's down some side street in Washington, D.C. So you, you see the change, and you know, you, you know which president made that change? Nixon. Now I can't be, he's almost looking good to me now. <laughs> Because he is the guy that brought us the Section 8 program, the Environmental Protection Agency, and believe it or not, the Air and Income Tax Credit, which is one of the most powerful ways we can help working people who are poor who are working to increase their income. So I used to, you know, I had a t-shirt once that said when Nixon was elected, I thought it was a flaw in the system. When Reagan was elected, I, I knew it was a flaw in the species. And now I'm, I'm wondering what the update of that t-shirt is, right? But, um, so we plug along and we do our work. And we, we do our work uh, with 
A lot of poor people who live in Hampshire and Franklin counties and some in Western Hampton County, which is the places where we're offering services. And there's a lot of hidden poor in these communities. You know, you walk down Main Street and you think, boy, this town's doing pretty darn well. There's a lot of poor people living in Northampton, a lot of poor people living in Hampshire County, and a lot of poor people living in Franklin County. And they're not, um, and, and many of them are um, uh, people who are, it's intergenerational poverty, people whose parents are poor and now they're poor. And it's because we don't have an economy that allows them to have jobs that will pay the wages they need to be able to rent in our communities. To um, they don't they live further and further out. We don't have a transfer sanitation system that serves them. There's a whole set of challenges if you're living in poverty. So what? So at the same time that we're offering these services, we're also trying to think systemically about what we need to change. Right. So some of the things are jobs. So we work collaboratively to create training programs. For instance, right now we have a grant to create one to do weatherization work on housing. It's better paying work than working at the 7-Eleven. You get a skill and you have a chance to move ahead. So we do some of that kind of work with workforce development. We work again on the two-generational approach with uh, young children and their parents. Every study that you've ever read will tell you that if you intervene early in the life of a young child, if you help them deal with, uh, with to, to, from birth to five, that investment is the single best investment that you can make in a young child. So we're doing that. We can only serve about 600 kids in the valley because we don't have enough. In the entire valley, about 600 kids. Because there's not enough money in that system, right? We work with young people doing employment. Again, a, a lot of every. Well, I guess it was a study for everything, as the um, choir director pointed out to us, because I didn't actually know you had to move your lips to sing. But, <laughs> but it's clear that working with young people to get them at, to work and not just sitting in the classroom makes a difference long term in their, in their prospects as adults, right? So, and we work to uh, work with young people also to help them think about how to cha make change in their communities. We do a lot of substance abuse work, and we also do uh, a lot of work in terms of um, peer mediation, for instance, in Turner's Falls. So it's that kind of work that we do. Uh, last thing, last piece of uh, the other thing we think about a lot, and this is the last thing I want to talk about, is, is social policy. Like, what what's necessary for us to advocate for to to make help people's lives be better. So in the kinds of things that Representative Vega is working on and the kinds of things that Representative Vega's successor, who I'm pretty sure is sitting behind me, are going to be working for on um, public policy around, um, around uh, criminal justice is incredibly important. We're very strong supporters of the increase of the minimum wage. We have a, a ballot question coming up uh, about the so-called millionaire's tax, which you know, I hate that name because of the, the name, the original name was the fair share tax. And believe me, they're not paying their fair share. But we'll, I'll go with the millionaire's tax. The challenge with calling it the millionaire's tax is in America, everybody thinks they're going to be a millionaire. And they don't want to tax the imaginary futures earnings of their, of their when they're a millionaire. Right? So, they, so that's why I worry about that. But we're very strong supporters of that, of trying to make, make sure that the tax system treats everybody fairly and brings them enough revenue to do what we want. Now, I just want to close with a thought about the Jane, Jane Addams model versus what we have today. Jane Addams really uh, believed in sort of the a community-based model where people were living in and among the community. Well, today, we have neighborhoods segregated by income, towns and cities segregated by income, and towns and cities and states segregated by income, race, uh, and, and political belief. So we don't have communities where people of all walks of life are mingling together anymore in the same way that they did. When I moved to Northampton, the poorest people live downtown. They don't live downtown anymore. In fact, it would be, you know, be hard pressed to find a poor person living downtown if they didn't have a subsidy. Right? So how do we create a com communities where they're open, the doors are open to people living at different points in the wage spectrum, and that, that people feel like no matter what their color is that they can come into that community? That's the challenge that we have. And we can deal with it right here. If somebody wants to build a house next door to you and it's not quite what you want, but it's going to have poor people in it, Maybe we say yes. Maybe we don't say no. You know, if if um, if your our taxes are going to go up a little bit, to, then it's going to make a huge difference for somebody. Maybe we say yes. Maybe we don't say no. Right? 
If, if our schools need investment, we say yes, not no. And I'll tell you, we say it for two reasons. One is because we know that we need to educate young children. And in a very selfish, selfish, selfish way, we do it because I want the person giving me the dose of medicine in the nursing home to know the difference between a milligram and a, a milli, millimeter, or whatever it is, a millimeter. <laughs> That's why I'm not a nurse. Um, so we have to think about that. What is our common obligation to each other? As a, and, and I think Jane Addams thought about that in that in her time, and we need to think about it in our time. So that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. Today, if you don't already know, right? Those young lords, make sure you do research and the great awakening. So, again, something maybe you can no, look up. Yeah, can I leave a book recommendation? Sure. If you want to read a really good book about uh, about the civil, about what's happened to people of color in our community, especially African American people, read a book called The Color of the Law. It's an incredible, have you read that, Attorney Newman? It's an incredibly good book, and it will make you understand our fundamental obligation to deal with the question of race in a very different way in this country. So I strongly suggest that. Well, the one point I was going to make is that it feels like so often when we reinvest in community-based organizations, when we reinvest in young people, it's when we face challenges. So even in our investments in social justice seem to be reactive instead of proactive. And when things seem to be okay, we stop paying attention and stop investing. And then when things get intense again, like last election, say at the national level, we suddenly scramble and have to reorganize again. It's how do we keep that sustainable, I think. John Weissman, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke, for putting this on and all your helpers. And thanks everybody for coming. It's, it's great to have another opportunity to talk about jobs for justice. But in this context of Jane Addams, I want to do a little reflection too, because there's similarities, of course, between the 1890s and uh, today, uh, keen in front of my mind is the idea of low union membership and high community activism, high self-organization, which she reflected. And the uh, situation that she was placed in, 1890, 1889, 1890, this is just a few years after the Haymarket Affair. So I wanted to reflect on that make sure at least you're aware of this, the great eight-hour movement and the Haymarket bombing. Um, on May 1st of 1886, half a million American workers, or workers in America, not all of them, as you know, we've heard a lot about the immigration, uh, the, the way that immigrants divide themselves up. Not everyone called themselves American, too. They were not, they were Germans, first, so they were Irish first. But they came together in the great eight hour a day movement that had started a few years earlier, mostly by, uh, led by the Carpenters Union. They all, across the country, laid down their tools and they vowed not to pick them up until they had won an eight hour day. This coordination that had been engineered by the Carpenters and the Knights of Labor and other organizations was unprecedented in the history of labor or in the history of the world. Keep in mind that this was the first time there was a massive strike wave coordinated across multiple cities. And the shock to the system was sufficient that many employers did grant the eight-hour day. One of the highly organized cities, of course, was Chicago where we were eventually going to get Hull House. 80,000 workers, largely immigrants, struck and the city was nearly closed. But on May 3rd, the McCormick Harvester Works were on strike. The bosses decided to lock out the lumber workers there and bring in scabs. And then the police attacked the picket line. On the third, the police attacked the picket line, shot people as they were running away, killed six strikers in the back. Now, the labor movement in Chicago at that time, and many major cities, was led by socialists, communists, and anarchists. It's sometimes, you know, 
impossible to think that, that that was acceptable theory at the time, these various theories of workers running the, uh, the economy of the society. And they had to operate through numerous newspapers in all the different languages. They had that capacity. And they called the leadership of the uh, Central Labor Union, at that time led by Albert Parsons, who was also an anarchist, an editor of a labor newspaper. Uh, the, lead, the Central Labor Union called a uh, protest in Haymarket Square over the, the shootings of the strikers. And there were a lot of speakers, including Parsons and others. And they, you know, the, the rally then dispersed. And as it was dispersing, somebody threw a bomb. And where they threw it was mostly where the police had gathered to police the event. And so seven policemen were killed. And this created mass hysteria among the wealthy. Now they had a, a, you know, a handle. And they basically rounded up without any kind of due process, shut down the news, we rounded up the communist anarchists and the leftists and the labor people. And they, this was the first version of the American Red Scare, which has repeated itself. So they thought they would discredit the, the, the ruling of the of Chicago, thought they could discredit the labor movement, especially the eight-hour day movement. And they quickly indicted a bunch of participants in the rally, including Albert Parsons. And then there was this show trial. And then on November 11th, 1887, Albert Parsons, Adolf Fisher, George Engel, Augustus Speech were hanged. These are the Haymarket Martyrs. This traumatized, radicalized, and convinced generations, at least the generation of young people then, and then successively, at least the next generation of Chicagoans and then the nation of young people getting into the labor movement, that um, eventually they became the organizers of the Wadleys, the industrial workers of the world, and then after that, this, the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Uh, they also, um, participated in the mass movement around all kinds of other issues, including at that time, you know, the suffragette movement. And the, um, by the way, the events of 1886, two years later, the AFL-CIO, I mean, the AFL was not the CIO until 55. The AFL, American Federation League, was a very young organization at that time. They sent me first as a time for action on an annual basis, and in 1890, the International Socialist Congress meeting in Paris made it a worldwide movement. And that's why May Day is a holiday today because of the American labor movement, in, especially in Chicago. Now, fast forward to today. I'd like to read one of the, a paragraph that has just stuck with me forever. It just, Think about it all the time, because I was born in 1946. 1946, the post-war strike wave of that year was massive too. But Elaine Bernard, our uh, foremost uh, labor educator in Boston, wrote, it's sobering to note that US unions have been in decline for the entire work life of the vast majority of today's workers. It was long ago in 1955 when unions reached their highest density. That is the proportion of the total workforce, which is union. Back then, one in every three workers was a union member. Leaders of the auto workers, steel workers, and other industrial unions were nationally recognized spokespersons for the majority of working people. At this level of representation, unions set the standard for wages and working conditions, not only for their members, but also for the non-union sector as well. Classic example, when all the supermarkets were union, 
the non-supermarket, the non-union supermarkets paid like a wide paid union scale. Now, all the supermarkets are non-union. Walmart's the example. Stop and Shop now has to lean on its union workers for takebacks. This flipping is the story of my life. Story of your life. I look at the, look at the gray hairs out there. And we hope we're bottoming. Union membership, there's some excitement there. We've got public sector came in at the time in 55, when you say one third of the union of uh, people were in the union, you got to remember that nobody in public sector was in the union at that time. The union movement in the public sector begins in the 60s with enabling legislation by states like Massachusetts. And the, so the decline in labor in the, in the states in general is masked by an increase in workers in the public sector. The, um, Another example is that the service sector has shown a certain kind of growth. And the service sector, though, where it's showing union growth is a coastal phenomenon. Massachusetts, New York, California. And that's, again, not enough for the overall decline, where in general now, only one in 10 workers in this uh, economy have a union card. So as this bottoming out happened, especially under Reagan, and employers were extremely emboldened under Reagan, the left wing of the labor movement decided they had to recover uh, through a new form of organization, which was actually just an old form of organization. You've heard about Hull House, you've heard about the fact that unions started inside a settlement house you know that the eight-hour day movement was led by unions, but it was larger than not union members. It was, there's, throughout our history, especially in the 30s and the 40s, when, uh, when the unions, the 30s when the unions are being formed and recognized by Uncle Sam, legitimated, and they continue to uh, grow with the war, that the union movement was always a community movement. You look at our factory towns, and where's the housing? Not only where's the housing, where's the barber shop? Where's the doctor's office? Where's the pharmacy? All in the same neighborhood. You walk across the street to go to a factory job in the old Springfield, the old Chickpea. So when you went on strike, it was a community strike. And the left wing labor movement, led by the Communication Workers of America, decided, uh, knew their history, and had to rebuild this kind of phenomenon. And they called it Jobs with, Gen uh, jobs with Justice. It, when we heard about it, this was in 87, when we heard about it in Massachusetts in 92, 93, we thought it was just a slogan we would get a bumper stick and put on a car. We were doing similar work, solidarity work with community groups. But it was basically not yet a real organization until more and more chapters were formed. And what a chapter is is a local coalition of labor, religious, community, and student organizations. They pledge to be there for each other five times a year. The idea of a lot of the thinking about this was I would credit to Larry Cohen, who's now the uh, chair of our revolution uh, and was very active in, the, uh, in Bernie's run for president. So the thinking has always been multifaceted, multi-organizational, and coalition building. So that we are now at a point where we want to have, similar to some episodes in the past, a permanent coalition that brings non-card-carrying members of society, non-union card-carrying members, into the labor movement. Andy Banks, a labor educator, put it this way. The jobs with justice model actually changes the very definition of what unions are. Instead of being organizations representing workers at particular facilities 
of particular employers, unions are transformed into a community-wide movement that organizes around workplace-related issues of economic justice and worker abuse. And then you take that a step further, this movement has created worker centers, not just union halls. Northampton is home to the Pioneer Valley Worker Center. Springfield at one time is home to the Alliance to Develop Power Worker Center, the first worker center in the country to be chartered by the AFL-CIO. AFL-CIO continues to charter worker centers. And then last but not least, this movement takes on legislative work at the governing level. The Raise Up Mass Coalition that Claire mentioned is who's behind the amendment, who's behind the increase in the minimum wage, paid family medical leave, earned sick time. All of that legislation is being moved by a coalition of labor, religious, student, and community organizers. It's a new version of the labor movement. Thanks. Thank you. This is another one of those examples where I know your history is going to repeat itself, right? So to build our fourth leg of our table here, David Glassberg, bring us bring from the UMass perspective and the arms. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, people hear me okay? Um, it's really an honor to be here uh, on a day dedicated to Jane Addams and her many legacies. Uh, my late mother was a social worker, and like many other social workers, was inspired by Addams. And my very first publication as a historian uh, 40 years ago was on the campaign of Jane Addams to uh, and other reformers in the early 20th century to provide public bath houses for immigrant neighborhoods. So, uh, kind of takes me back to think about Jane Addams. Um, the term environmental justice didn't come into usage until the 1980s, but in fact, Jane Addams and several other women of her generation could think of um, Ellen Swallow Richards, who was an MIT chemist, who was responsible for all the water quality laws in the early 20th century in Massachusetts. Um, Alice Hamilton, who was a medical doctor who was responsible for a lot of the uh, laws about industrial health and safety, including um, very early on a recognition of the toxicity of lead. Um, so all these women essentially could be considered, along with Adam, as sort of the foremothers of this movement. Um, environment was really important to Jane Adams uh, because of its connection to public health. In 20 years at Hull House, her book that is most widely read, um, she relates her experiences to garbage collect or garbage inspector in her neighborhood, encouraging residents not only to clean up their own front steps and back alleys, but to organize them to pressure Chicago city government to provide better service, which meant challenging the word boss who didn't much care about the quality of such services as long as their contractors were loyal political supporters who paid in kickbacks. In a nutshell, uh, environmental justice means that all citizens, no matter where they live, have the same right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment. Lois Gibbs brought this issue to national prominence in the 1970s, battling for her neighbors in the vicinity of Love Canal toxic waste dump in western New York. But the movement really took off um, in the 1980s when African American residents of Warren County, North Carolina, fought the siting of yet another waste facility in their area and identified the blatant racism that was underlying these decisions about where uh, waste dumps were, were located. Um, Jumping ahead a little bit, an executive order by President Bill Clinton mandated that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency take environmental justice considerations into account. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, that executive order remains in effect, though uh, it's clear it's not a priority with the current EPA. In my remaining time, I want to briefly discuss the environmental activities of Arise for Social Justice, as uh, no representative of that organization was free to come this afternoon. Uh, 
They're based in Springfield and were founded 40 years ago primarily to uh, help poor people with immediate needs for shelter and other services. But about 10 years ago, its founder, Michael Ambusey, recognized that with the city's asthma rate double the state average, that something had to be done. So it joined with residents of uh, an Indian Orchard neighborhood to try to halt the building of a power plant in their neighborhood that would be, uh, be burning waste wood. Uh, and they've been active in trying to reduce the city's reliance on Havana's regional incinerator plant on Bobby's Island and is in the forefront of efforts right now in the city of Springfield to pass a plastic bag ban like we have in Northampton. In 2013, a rise uh, with other area organizations formed the Springfield Climate Justice Coalition uh, to address the disproportionate impact that rising global temperatures is having and will have on poor people and people of color. We see this impact not only in polar regions and in the Pacific Islands, uh, but also much closer to home in the aftermath of violent storms such as Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, Hugo in Houston, and of course Irene in Puerto Rico. As oceans warm and the frequency and intensity of such storms increase, it's really only a matter of time before disastrous weather events, hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards, a heat wave, hit Springfield again. In, 19, in, in 2016, uh, the city of Springfield received a grant from U.S. Housing and Urban Development to develop a climate action and resiliency plan, uh, which includes disaster preparedness. And the Springfield Climate Justice Coalition was actively involved over the year 2016 and 2017 with holding a series of public meetings in the North End and other vulnerable neighborhoods to ensure that the voices of the residents uh, will be heard in the formation of the plan. Uh, the plan was just completed in July of 2017, and the Springfield Climate Justice Coalition is now trying very hard to pressure the mayor and the city departments to follow through on the actions recommended in the plan kind of echoing in a way Jane Adams pressuring the war bosses in Chicago on garbage collection, but on a much bigger scale. Um, while rising global temperatures was not a crisis situation in Jane Adams' time, even though the carbon dioxide uh, from all the coal and oil that was burned during her lifetime is still in the atmosphere warming our planet, um, Rising global temperatures and climate change is unquestionably, except perhaps in Washington, D.C., a crisis in our time. As James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. The women of Jane Addams generation describe their environmental reform efforts as municipal housekeeping. And now all of us must work tirelessly to expand these efforts to the entire planet. Thank you. Yeah, there's quite a lot there, and I think uh, two quick comments would be, one, I worry that the current EPA is not concerned about the environment in general, uh, and um, that I think one of the things that we heard from everybody is that history, as I said before, matters, and that we are often re-fighting those fights, and words matter. I think words matter a lot, and the words that were used up here today really matter. We talk about engagement, we talk about community building, we talk about movements, and I think one of the most important word changes that we've tried to work on and Palante presented today was, you know, a lot of times people talk about dropouts, and we've tried to change that paradigm and talk about pushed out. Uh, so when you talk about restorative justice, you talk about social justice, economic and environmental justice, what a lot of us are concerned about is making sure that no matter where you're from, right, we talk about no matter what part of Hoyoke or what zip code you're from, that you have an equal shot to succeed in your life. And I think that's what everyone up here is trying to represent. So again, to all of our speakers here, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I'm not sure the time thing, but I'm going to turn it over to uh, see if there's some questions from our audience on any of our speakers uh, to have a little more of an open conversation. Yes, excellent. Are there other schools in the area that have a similar club like yours or a 
program? One thing I'll say is I walk up to it. I will say that our good friends in the Amherst contacted our former principal last year and asked, even though the uh, social justice has been on the Amherst High School sort of uh, uh, pamphlets, they didn't actually have a program. So, but yeah, let's take it away. We got it.
we have set up a system that rewards this kind of terrible, terrible behavior. So I'm not quite on point with your journalism issue, although I agree with you. But I'm also really concerned about the fact that we have set up, you know, with the Jane Addams Day, philanthropy was, she was living in the community. Her friend was giving her money to help keep that open. Today, we're letting these drug dealers uh, in the Dow Museum at, at Yale. It's, it's a terrible thing. The one hope I have around journalism and fear is the rise of the internet. So it's much harder to bang down the wall, right? To, to whack the wall when it pops back up somewhere else. The problem is it's become much harder and harder and harder to figure out what's true and what's not true. So, you know, I'm not going to curse in a church, but there's a lot of BS <laughs> on the internet. We have to figure out how to create detectors that can, and, 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 and how to, to truth squad that collectively so that people know what's true and what's true. I have no problem dating the poly <laughs> oh, just a very quick comment in relation to the philanthropic things. Back in the 1980s, uh, Ivan Mosky, who was this notorious Wall Street guy, crook, yeah, crook essentially, uh, tried to give money to Princeton and they turned it down. And the line was because they didn't want money that had been stolen so recently. <laughs> I do think I do think that we are going to see. I mean, we've, we've heard it now. You know, now all these new words that it was focused on fake news. What's real? How do we find out what's real? Um, you know, looking to those credible sources. Uh, it is going to, I think it's going to become a much more uh, front center topic as, as at least for the next three years as the politics moves forward and people are looking for information and we have the internet and um, how do we keep those in the back? How do we keep those in check? And this yes. is a major issue because it's a Latino community. So, so thank you very much. And this is a really interesting combination of environmental justice and the social justice because you know so so many people are learning about their identities and just getting the opportunity to to learn more about themselves and and their communities and coming to this place in a new way. But, but meanwhile, uh, and, and, and those are, are differences, right? And, um, and understanding differences and acknowledging them. But meanwhile, the environmental issues uh, are, shared, are shared issues. And we all need clean water, we all, all need clean air, and, and we all, all are seeing some of those, uh, those kind of bedrock issues being rolled back in part because we don't have this a sort of unified swell of people saying we all need clean water, we all share clean air, you know, and part of that is because the different neighborhoods have experienced uh, injustices. So how do how how does that work? How do we how do we bring people together? Because definitely, as we move forward uh, with climate change, it's going to be a pressing issue. This generation is to come together as one. All, all, all. I think it's interesting, uh, you often hear people say, you know, in the business community or something, there's too much regulation, and then there's this is blanket statements, and I say, well, which ones? The, the regulations that keep our clean air and water safe to drink? We want to keep those regulations in place. <laughs> Comments, David, David's founder. Yeah, no, I, I think you identified a huge challenge, which is that the environmental justice community and its history are really parallel, but not intertwined much with the overall environmental movement that you think of, if you think of John Muir, the Sierra Club. And it's only recently that I think the mainstream environmental organizations are realizing that they need to reach out uh, to this other strand that had been there actually all along, uh, people fighting for particularly public health in their local communities. And, you know, I think if they neglect those movements, it's really at their own peril because it's going to remain a very isolated and small minority kind of uh, or, uh, movement. And in fact, when you look at public opinion polls, even still, climate change, I don't even think is in the top 10 in terms of things that Americans are concerned about. Um, and in order for that to move up the, the list to become a number one priority or even a top three priority, along with war and peace and some of the other things, it really is going to take all of us and all different kinds of people coming together. 
and realizing these intersections, particularly involving environmental justice and all the other kinds of nature preservation work that's been taking place. Yeah, I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was gonna try to reframe a little bit of both questions and see if I can send it back here a little bit. So, um, you know, I grew up in, in South Hoyle on the Park Street, which is now Clemente Avenue, and I, was, I don't know where all of you are from, but as you all know, I mean, in Hoyle's DNA, it's built in, right? I mean, discrimination is almost built into the city. I mean, it's, as was mentioned earlier, you know, the factory housing, the flats in South Hoyle were right by the, by the, of course, they were communities where you had a lot of businesses. But as you literally go up the hill in Hoyle, it gets beautiful, right? There's these bigger homes and these bigger yards. Um, and we built recently in the last 10 years a trash transfer station. It was not built in Northampton, on Northampton Street. It was built on Main Street in South Hoyle. Um, from your perspective, I mean, environments, your built environments, is that something that, that you guys are concerned about? Do you think about how, where you live, the differences with our own city? So I take a course on contemporary issues and we deal a lot with like how uh, climate change differs from uh, where you live. So I live in the flats personally and so he opened my eyes by saying they, the first location that they wanted to put like, um, like a dump I think it was, was in the flats because that's where the people who nobody really cares about lives. So like and it's just a bit insane because you, oh, you see a bunch of um, white people live like in the highlands and just like you see the a bunch of Puerto Ricans like where you see any white people living in the flats and it's just a bit insane. I, yeah. um, I, I'm David Sarana and I personally live near the college which is like you know, not necessarily the flats, but um, you can definitely see the difference between the two environments. For example, like if you go down the street where in my neighborhood you very rarely see any trash, you see a bunch of green lawns, but if you take um, a stroll down the street, like a few blocks down, then you see trash everywhere, you see like the canals, you see like um, trash on the outlines of the canals. Um, you can see that there's very compact living and like there's a lot of like plus the exhaust like all the exhaust because of the car is it doesn't necessarily like I think have suitable housing for children and, like, and it creates a very bad environment for them. Absolutely. Well, again, also I think has the highest asthma rates in the state for, for many years. Um, and continues to, and I think there's been a lot, you know, going back to your, there's been a lot of movement around making sure, I know that the uh, energy bill coming out, we've been trying to work on making it much more cost effective to put, you know, solar panels and sort of renewable energy on low income housing because it makes a lot more sense. Uh, you know, someone up, up on the, up in the highlands by the college can afford to put solar panels in their house, great, good for them, but let's get people who are already in a situation where they may not be able to afford those bills, let's lessen those bills and again make it much more sustainable. Yeah. Um, so the way the young lords did it was when there was like a whole bunch of trash that was being picked up in the communities was they picked it up all together and then when they burned it in like the uptown cities where there's like <laughs> more wealthy people. And finally the it started to be resolved, people started actually like getting the trash, you know, bring it to the dump where it's supposed to be. The city finally picked it up. Instead of them doing it, it was the city. The city, the city finally like took yeah responsibility for what they were supposed to be doing. Um, I just wanted to make a point. I think it's uh, I love this topic here. I love it. Um, I, I being and being a um, student of Holyoke High before these guys years ago, um, and growing up around families like Arab and his father, um, just have been able to see both gentrification through um, the years, and not only that, just the difference, and now owning a car, being able to go from different, what I like to call it, it's holding this like has some boroughs, just like New York, um, and they identify these communities the way you heard kids, the flats, South Holyoke, the Highlands, um, all these different areas, um, and I think just this morning, and picking up for you my small coupe, um, if we were able to look through the window, because I know you have a little window in the back, uh, you can see the differences. We picked up South and Flats 
um, we were able to go up towards. Um, I don't even really understand what they call your neighborhood. Um, but <laughs> it's, the, the, it's over by Sherman I don't know if you guys know where Sherman Horns is. It's over by Sherman Horns. Um, and then we get to go back down towards, you know, Springdale, um, where Marco lives. All very different neighborhoods, but all neighborhoods where if you turn the corner, um, very weirdly enough, you have a little very nice place, and then you turn the corner and you have what other people would consider a, a troubled area or somewhere not so safe um, for this youth. So I think it's really interesting for them to be able to see that just being in my car in the morning, picking up somebody who's in a classroom but lives in a different type of neighborhood. Um, I had something else, but uh, yeah, I just think it's, it's very interesting. It, it's, it, it's a Saturday for me. <laughs> um, I think it's very interesting, though, to see the differences in the neighborhoods and how close they are. And I took, oh, this was my example. I have, there's this one neighborhood, um, if you're going towards the mall, and I'm pretty sure it's still considered bullying, um, and it's Han, no, it's Hanush, actually. The family who owns Hanush Jewelers owns a legit part of, of the neighborhood. It's a street. Um, and uh, none of my students knew that this place was like real. Um, and it's in Holyoke. It's legit, if you just go up the hill and go into this neighborhood, these houses are unbelievable. It's like mansions. And I take my kids there because it's, check this out. This is in our neighborhood. You guys can have this. You guys can have these huge houses. You know, as long as you do what I'm telling you to do in school. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but in all reality, in all reality, it's literally right up the hill. It's a five minute drive right next to the mall. You would never even know this neighborhood was there. If you've never been there, I suggest you try it. Um, it's Hanush something. It's a street named after them. Um, and I don't even know if the whole family has houses up there, but I know that the houses are humongous, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Just one note about Western Massachusetts. We do weatherization and energy efficiency work throughout Western Mass. Western Mass is some of the oldest housing stock in the state. So the kinds of challenges that you're talking about in houses in Ohio, drive through Orange, Massachusetts and look at the housing stock in Orange, Massachusetts, or drive through some of the other very small rural communities that we have. Falling down housing, not insulated, not safe, in the rural communities, no access to gas in the street, so that they're heating with wood, they're heating with oil, they're heating with whatever they can get, get their hands on, and the house, and it's just blowing right out the, right out the end. My mother used to say, we're heating the great outdoors, you know? And so, uh, the single best bang for our buck that we could get to, to reduce our energy footprint would be to build houses that were more weather tight and didn't heat, send the heat all out the, all out the side of it. Um, we're hoping to get some more money in to do more weather, more deep weatherization work. The feds in the state and the electric utility companies don't pay for us to re-insulate um, or replace old insulation. But to do, there's a whole set of things they won't pay for us to do. If we can get more money to do that kind of work, we can do something about those houses that are not weather tight. The kids are, are, are have got towels stuffed in the window to keep the draft off off the off them when they're sleeping. So. You know, I'm not even sure where that money's going to come from. I think the utility companies have been pretty good at putting some of that money up. We have to push harder to get more of it. Solar panels are the icing on the cake. Let's tighten up the houses. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Next question. You know, two, two of the issues that have come up, and I think it's uh, you can also see the difference in Hoya when you drive around when you see the parks. Right, there's been a lot of money. We have a lot of parks in Hollywood, and the number of parks that have been renovated over the last decade are definitely above the, mostly above the Northampton Street line. Right, we know about the tofu curtain right over here between Hollywood and Northampton. There's another line in Hollywood, Northampton Street kind of divides, or even Beach Street kind of divides the city uh, in another direction. And I think that the kids mentioned that, you know, the trash in the street, I think it's something that we have to, and I think the young people have to kind of step up and remind our, our community that, you know, you walk through, you want to the communities, as, as, as Ernest talked about, there's poverty in Northampton, you just don't see it. There's poverty in our head of towns, you just don't see it as much. And there's something about the optics of Hoyoke that people have this different reaction, this go reaction when they come to Hoyoke. And a lot of times it's just because of the built environment. And that's been something we've really been trying to work on. It's been a while since I've studied the settlement house founders, particularly the women who were involved in the settlement house movement. But one thing I remember very vividly from the readings I was doing about what they were thinking they were up to was a metaphor about the home 
and how, and kind of their understanding of what was private and what was public. And so their idea about the home was that they could be in a settlement house and settle in um, in a way that was parallel to a kind of upper middle class domestic home. And I think when we think about environmental justice issues, they're thinking inside, they're thinking internally inside the home rather than in terms of public parks, for example, even though some of them get involved in, in that later. But, but they take that kind of idea of their own homes as a sort of way of extending hospitality into what are working class ethnic neighborhoods. Um, and I guess I feel a little ambivalent about that, you know, partly um, from my own background, but also partly from the history isn't a very equal, it's not a very equal kind of equation of sort of taking your values and imposing them on, on a neighborhood. I think we've, I think there, there are different dynamics today, which I think the restorative justice program people are going to be dealing with. Um, I just I guess having made a few comments that are sort of random, I was, would love to know whether you guys go to the library in Holyoke. It's just been redone. Do you guys spend any time there? Um, I, I go to the library. Um, throughout the summer, I went to the library because um, I would go there with friends. At, at first, I necessarily didn't go to the library. I didn't even, when I first moved to Kaluk, I didn't know there was a library. But um, I made a few right choices with friends and I started spending more time with the library. And yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very nice. Um, just to talk about the renovations of the library, I think the library obviously is beautiful. Um, it really is up to date as far as I can tell. Um, my only, and I think that they're getting a lot better at it, they have a sort of an office there just for the youth. Um, and they have multiple youth rooms now available. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I've seen improved. Um, usually you walk in and you really feel out of place. I mean, libraries are a little intimidating, so to speak. Um, we're always grown up to know to stay quiet and not do certain things in the library. They've kind of changed their dynamic, so to speak. You still need to be quiet, but at the end of the day, you'll know where to go and you'll feel comfortable. Um, aside from that, the um, connection between the library and the school system, that is what I'm looking for a little bit more from, but they do have one person in there that's working with the youth that is doing really well um, and communicating with us and trying to keep in touch with us and letting us know when there are um, forums or there's somebody going to be speaking at the library or there's a movie series or the tons of these other things. So, then. Uh, so, library for me is like a danger zone because the only reason I say that is because I'm not really quite a person, I can't sit still, so I always have to move and I always have to talk, I always have to be doing something. So instead of reading books, I mean I can read, but it has to be a certain type of books. So what I do have is I have a mentor, and what he does is he guides me, he teaches me, and he shows me books only that will benefit me and interest me in the future. So, um, I, I, we're, 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 I think we're have one more question. I just, just want to do maybe we, maybe two last two questions. I just want to do one quick thing. This is another. It was touched upon talking about culture, but just. It's a whole other panel another day, but for our restorative justice youth, how many of you guys were born in Holyoke? Born in Holyoke. How many of you were born in Puerto Rico? No. New York? No. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about culture, uh, it's, I think it's, despite the fact that Puerto Ricans have lived in Holyoke for now going on four or five decades, there's been um, a difference of ownership and lack thereof sometimes, and that's sort of built it now. Um, there's been a lot of migration back and forth and transiency, and so you don't have, at this point, as you have, say, an Irish or French Canadian community, where someone can say, you know, I've been here for five generations, and there's sort of this pride. We're sort of looking and saying, we want new people to come to Hoyle, and that's what they represent. So last two questions. Hi. So I'm Jessica Hi. Um, 
So um, my question is for the kids in Hollywood. Um, and it's about how do you, are you making progress? I love the, the fact that you have a, a goal in mind. You want to keep kids in school. You want to reduce the graduation rate. You have like a very clear vision based on, on you know, your analysis of the problem. Do other people in your community, specifically the school administration, are they starting to share your vision? Are they, are they uh, coming on board with you know, the school board, the leadership? The people in charge of the institution, and, um, and how can that uh, how can that be brought about? That's not yeah. So uh, you have support. Uh, I think it's uh, decreased the dropout, increased the graduation. Do you have support from the administration? Do you feel you have support from the administration? Um, and well, if you've seen our school in the news, um, for one of them, it might have been for the assembly that recently happened in early October. Um, the administration did show support for our group um, during that time uh, throughout the backlash and um, misunderstood parts of the assembly. Um, so I would say yes, they do give us support. I, I would just add, add, if there was any other comment from the kids, I do want to add that um, Stephen's wife, who's a superintendent, is very supportive. In fact, last session, last term, he and I worked to find money to keep the program going. Doesn't mean that every teacher and every administrator is on board. <laughs>